everybody, it's Luke at Young Writers, and I'm here today with Piers Torday. How are you doing? I'm really well. Lovely to be here. Cool. Um, so anyone out there that is watching and hasn't managed to uh, read your wonderful books before, could you tell us a little bit about yourself in your own words? Uh, so my name is Piers, as you said, uh, and I write books for children, mainly aged sort of eight to 12, I guess. And um, my first book uh, was called The Last Wild. And it's uh, an adventure about a boy called Kester who uh, can't talk to people, um, but he discovers he can talk to animals. And this really matters because he lives in a world where a mysterious virus, I know we've all had enough of those, has killed nearly all the animals in the world. And he finds a few that have survived called The Last Wild, The Last Wild Animals. And he has to try and save them. And that's what he does over three books of a series. And that kind of got me really into writing these fantasy adventures for young people. Uh, and I've written about um, eight books. Um, and um, there's the Last Wild series. And there's the Lost Magician series, which is my kind of homage to the Narnia books, which I loved as a kid. Um, only you going through a magical library rather than a magical wardrobe. Um, I've got there maybe a castle which is um, a kind of snowy Christmassy adventure because I love, I remember as a kid curling up with snowy Christmassy books. They were some of my favorite. Um, and I've also written some plays. Um, I adapted Box of Delights, the John Macefield children's classic that some people may remember the TV version of uh, and Christmas Carol. Um, and I've written some short stories and yeah, that is, that is me and that is what I do. Cool. So, I mean, actually, as you mentioned, like going back to when you was younger, something that I find really interesting, and this is something that, that I also chatted to uh, Catherine Woodfine about, but you took or ha have taken a very writing oriented approach. You know, I've interviewed a few other authors who uh, either like accidentally stumbled into it, always knew that they loved writing and kind of, you know, found it uh, as an accident. But I remember reading, you know, that you grew up in a bookshop kind of like crawling around uh, books and kind of just began writing and I think that's a different not a different approach but um, one that not everyone takes so do you want to kind of uh, take us through that journey because there might be some other writers there watching kind of understanding their own journeys. Yeah I was um, basically doomed from the start because um, <laughs> I grew up in um, in Northumberland in the north of England and my mum uh, when I was little she ran a bookshop she didn't know anyone they just moved there to this town called Hexham. And so to meet people, she opened a bookshop, which she called Total Books after um, Total and Wind of the Willows. Um, and so when I was a toddler, I was, you know, she would be in the bookshop and I'd be on the floor pulling all the big heavy books down off the shelves and I don't know, trying to lick them probably <laughs> rather than read them. Uh, and so I've kind of, and my mum said that she read books to me even when I, you know, she was carrying me even before I was born. And so I've kind of always been surrounded by books and um, my both my dad and my mum loved reading stories to me when I was little, like, you know, the Narnia stories or the Hobbit or things like that. And they also read comics to us and all sorts of things. And so I kind of, they just, I think books were in my life from the start. It seemed like a sort of a good thing to, to, to want to do. Um, but that also creates its own pressure in a way because you're, you're so aware of how many brilliant books there are. It can make you a bit um, self-conscious. But I also think it was inevitable that having uh, just been exposed to so many words and pictures at a young age that I did start writing and making up my own quite early on. Um, and I lived in the middle of the countryside and, you know, pre, pre the internet, there wasn't always a huge, you know, it was quite an, you know, TV, certainly for kids didn't start till quite late in the day. So tea time after school was only on for about 10 minutes. And so I kind of started making up little stories just partly because I was bored a lot of the time, to be honest, and uh, made little comics. I made a comic about uh, a hero called Super Sid, who lives in a, a village full of superheroes. And his superpower is that he doesn't have a superpower. Um, and that put that into a local newspaper. And I think, I just began to enjoy, I was encouraged to share stories at school mm -hmm. um, by a very enlightened primary school teacher. 
And I think I got a lot of pleasure when people enjoyed a story or made them laugh. Um, and so that was that was kind of the beginning. But it took me a really long time from that like childhood interest to find my path as a professional writer. I did loads of job, you know, I did lots of play drama at university. So I ended up working in theatre at the Edinburgh Festival after university. And then um, I found my sort of migrated from theatre to telly. And I worked in TV for time. I come up with ideas and producing things. But it wasn't until my mid 30s that I really, and I, all that time at, you know, university and afterwards in my 20s, I tried to write books and they were all, it was all terrible. And I didn't have any confidence and I didn't know what I was trying to say. And then it wasn't until my mid 30s that I just suddenly, I don't know, it just kind of clicked. Mm. And I took myself off on a writing course and began to kind of write properly. Um, so it's never never too late, but it does, as you say, it absolutely goes back yeah. to that childhood discovery of books. But that, I think that's actually quite nice because you you sort of have like the best of both worlds. You know, it's some people out there like live and breathe books and they they know it's where they want to go. They know it's what they're going to do and they, and they kind of charge at it. And, and that was like, to some extent, you know, you went, as you say, about the bookshop and, and writing comics when you was younger but also you didn't fall into it until, you know, you just said you're, you're mid thirties. So it kind of, uh, in a way, marries both, both together. And it's, it's, all, it's always quite nice to, to show, you know, writers out there or whatnot that um, oftentimes it, it will happen if it's meant to happen or, you know, it doesn't have to happen right now. I think there's a lot of pressure on children in school to kind of, you know, at 16, like, what do you want to do? Go do it work towards it or whatever and and that's not always the case and when you look at a lot of you know writers authors musicians whatever um it, it didn't always happen that way and uh, it's just really interesting to to get the stories of, of, of all these people yeah it takes and i think the thing with writing is that it's a very certainly writing fiction writing a book you know it's so personal and you're really often trying to you know, sum up a, a lifetime's kind of experience and memories and your feelings about things. And it just takes, I think people underestimate, it just takes a long time to work out how mm -hmm. to do that. And I think the thing I discovered was that um, it, it's about coming to the page, if you like, each day. So sit down and just try and write something, even if you're not sure where it's going or if it's any good. Because the more you do that, the more confidence you will start to have in your own voice and your own abilities. And um, and I, you kind of also realize that, uh, you know, the thing I've realized the more books I write, it's the first time you write anything, it's always rubbish. It's always terrible. Like it never, you know, to, to get something into kind of book form just takes so many drafts and edits and, um, but, and that's much easier when you're published and having, you know, an editor saying, right, where's the book and an agent saying, you need to do it by this date, because that kind of forces you to do it. Yeah. Starting out when you don't have an agent or a publisher, you have to really kind of force yourself and draw on big reserves of confidence to do it. Mm. Because um, you, you, you do need to encourage yourself constantly because it won't, it won't happen by itself. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that kind of is mirrored by um, most people or everyone that I've spoken to, at least, is that it's never, or well not never, but it's, it's not always good. You know, I think a lot of people and, and the way it's possibly portrayed in, you know, films, TV or whatever, is you'll kind of sit down and bash out a book and it's done and it's great. And then it's on the, on the shelves like the next day and you write it within 12 hours and it's amazing. And, and it never happens like that. And, you know, we spoke to like Cressida Cow. And she said, like, some of her top advice would be just to write. If it's rubbish, it doesn't matter. You know, write, practice, love it, do it. And then you come back to it and you change it. And if something's really good or, you know, something stands out, edit it and work on it. And, and that's something that I think a lot of people say. But uh, moving on onto your, onto your book series, I was going to bring up the, the wonderful uh, mirror between life and, and your books with the raging virus that's taken over the world so maybe it maybe it's breathing a new life you know maybe it's coming back around but there is of course as well this um large concept of environmentalism the environment and and kind of 
putting that towards the younger generation. And I think that's something that's really important now more than ever. So do you want to maybe tell us a little bit about a bit more about the book series and, and the messages? So I, um, as I said, I grew up in the countryside and I was very lucky to grow up, you know, in, out by the woods and remember seeing a lot of wildlife growing up, you know, saw badgers and otters and woodpeckers and toads and things and uh, all, all, all sorts of uh, animals. And it was kind of, as I got older uh, and then I moved to London, um, obviously I saw a little less wildlife. Yeah. <laughs> but then I really began to notice that there was just generally less wildlife everywhere. Mm. Uh, and then came the news, um, I guess, the beginning of this decade that we're now very familiar with, but really that we are in this middle of this extinction event where since before I was born, we've lost over 60% of the wildlife on this planet. And which in human terms is basically like losing everyone in Europe, America, Africa, and China. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And so I, and that matters, I suppose, because we're all connected. Mm. You know, we're all part of the same ecosystem. And eventually if the animals go, if the insects go, if the bees go, we'll be in real trouble. And so I really wanted to write children about this because I know that children obviously respond well to animals. I think it's much harder to engage children about, you know, temperature changes and ice things melting and, you know, all these abstracts of climate change, which are just yeah. as important, but they're not. Whereas animals, I think um, children obviously love animals, I think often because they're vulnerable, um, they're small and no one listens to them. So I think, uh, it's quite easy for children to identify with the situation animals find themselves in. And I wanted to give animals a voice, you know, two and a half million other species that share this planet with us. And yet they have no say in the many decisions human beings make, which affect their habitat, their food, their quality of life, their lifespan. And so I really wrote the last wild books where a boy who can't talk to people discovers he can talk to animals and he gives animals a voice mm. and um and i use the idea of the virus to be a sort of allegory for climate change itself mm. um and that was pre-covid but it was also post foot and mouth yeah uh, the foot and mouth pandemic which was you know the first pandemic of this century not on the scale of covid for humans but for animals it was horrific you know i'm sure everyone i don't know if you can re remember or people can look up but the sort of piles of burning animals um, and the kind of uh, effect that had on animal's life in the, in the noughties. Um, but I wrote three books on climate change for children, The Last Wild, The Dark Wild, and The Wild Before, Wild Beyond. And there's never, you've never said anything on climate change, but I felt I'd said quite enough. Mm. I should probably shut up about it for a bit. <laughs> um, and then um, when Greta Thunberg appeared, um, I just found that so inspiring because here was a young person who was just not afraid to speak truth to power and she took on powerful people and you know and she told them the way the world was that it was on fire and and they she said it so insistently that they had to listen and she also inspired um, children you know to go on strike and to go and protest because and I think she kicked the sort of climate change discussion into a new yeah. level, which is this new urgency, because we're now, we've gone from being a bit worried about climate change to like it's actually happening yeah. around us, the heat. Mm -hmm. COVID of course is a climate uh, crisis as much as a public health one. So I went back and, and I, I decided to write a prequel to the last world, which is the world before and the last wild books are quite dystopian because they're set in this world without animals. And so the good news is, or this is the sort of world before, this is really about why what we have is so precious mm -hmm. and, uh, and why you should love it and look after it, but also about how to find hope and resilience when that world is under threat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's... It's just really important, you know, as you said, Greta Thunberg really brought it into our attention and hopefully was a spearhead for the younger generation. And I think what's really important at the moment 
is that we are kind of bringing the next generation up with these ideas and you know and these concepts because ultimately they are the ones that are going to be coming into you know the next age and the next generation and and looking after the world and and it being their responsibility and if we have people and, and books like these they're going to come up with the right ideas and, and the right kind of education around the environment when they do come into charge and uh, you know books like this really help and they put it into a way that you know can influence children but also as you say I think one thing that we all love in a book and, and find is hope and inspiration and they piece together this idea that you can make a difference and and we should love it rather than just here's a problem <laughs> you know what are we going to do it's it's here's a problem you can make the change you can make the difference and one thing that we always try and say is that anyone can make a difference and anyone can make a change and everyone has to and that's something really important and you know you said about uh, children relating with animals it's it's kind of also the opposite because they are the ones who can make a difference as everyone can and it's just, it's just a really important message and an important book um so yeah and that, so that's the, the fourth one but it's the prequel so if no one yes pick them up before <laughs> uh, then you go back back to the original one which was called what was the first one called again the, la the last wild the last wild and then this the last one... wild is confusingly the first book and the wild <laughs> before is confusing and this one's the wild before which is the prequel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> however i mean a fascinating series um and and important and inspiring and hopeful and you know, positive, even if it is about a virus that uh, impacts these animals, it, ultimately it, it's positive and it's in doing important work. So hopefully some people out there go and, and they pick them up and they kind of get inspired from them. But uh, I have one final question and it could be related to what we just talked about. It could be related to writing. It could be anything that you want. But if you could broadcast one message to every uh, maybe child, uh, younger generation, young writer, whatever it may be, what would that message be? That's quite a big one. But <laughs> that message would be that your ideas and your thoughts are valid, mm. and they are unique because every single human being is an individual, and whatever your idea is, you may think someone else has done it before loads of other people are doing this maybe but they won't be doing it in the way you're doing it and your take on something your belief your instinct that your idea is good is absolutely true and i would just encourage everyone to hold on to that if you have an instinct that you're going to be good at something or you should try something absolutely believe in that because um that's your kind of true self authentic self speaking and you should you should always hang on to it and never give up till that appetite is kind of satisfied. I mean, amazingly, amazingly surmised. Uh, yeah, truly very important. And that can apply to anyone. So thank you. Um, the, the Last Wild is the first book in the series and you, anyone can grab that now. The, the Wild Before is the new one coming out. So make sure to pick that up too. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great. Cool. Have a great day.